Hey guys, it's Celine. Um, today's Wednesday, the 5th, I think, of January, yes, uh, 2022. It's the new year, hallelujah. <laughs> we finally got here, at least that's how I feel. Um, I'm in my kitchen with as many lights on as possible. I've even got candles. You can see two candles in my glasses, like so. Um, because otherwise I really look very grey and I still feel like it's all grey and pale and bluish <laughs> in the camera, but never mind. I've got me a nice huge mug of Saloop here, which contains uh, a couple of pieces of ginger and lemon and some um, sage, uh, a rosebud and a stick of thyme went in there. So that should uh, warm me up nicely. Um, it's not that cold. It's five degrees or so uh, Celsius above zero. But uh, I was out for a while, a while, a, a while ago. And um, it was very windy. You know, the wind is in the north-ish, northwest, whatever. And that means very, you know, refreshing. And you have to really be active outside if you uh, want to be out there. Um... I didn't come out to talk about the weather necessarily. I'm just trying to do me some introductory remarks here <laughs> so that I'll uh, adjust to filming myself again because it's been a while other than my little uh, Happy New Year vlog which I did on, uh, on Monday which seems already like it's a week ago. It isn't really, but still. Okay, so now I've got a bit of sage leaf right there. Or something, maybe a rose leaf. Um, I've come out because there's been quite a a tumo development again, and um, I'm not completely sure I'll manage, as I often say, you know, at this kind of a point, whether I'll be able to manage to put some of it into words. Um, so we'll just, uh, you know, go for it. I think the thing is that I have been so okay so let me do a quick potential recap of my tumo as I practice it at this moment you know what's been happening over the past two years I started off doing what I call uh, my tumo practice in a I suppose very rudimentary manner compared to how I do it nowadays um, based off of a few lines of text um, from the six yogas of Naropa originally, combined with some other information that I had, I actually, I suppose, without any lineage, or at least none that I am aware of myself at this time still, um, I managed to figure out how it works. <laughs> so here I am and I've been sharing over the past two years what it's been like, what it's been doing, how it's changed and so on and so forth. Where it it, it really works with Kundalini Yoga, with Kundalini energy or Shakti energy as I tend to call it more often. Except you find you you using a different approach n next to the sort of a kundalini shakti knowledge that we have we use a uh, a set of um i suppose different uh, processing stations which originate or which are most explicitly described and known in chinese medicine and the two uh, traditions, so the Chinese tradition of the Dantians, the Indian tradition of the knowledge of Shakti and Kundalini, which is basically nearly the same thing, uh, they met in Tibet, apparently, where there was real need for this kind of process, this kind of practice to uh, for the people who live at high altitudes in bitter cold with no central heating and, you know, nomadic lifestyle or what have you so i notice also for myself for example that as i do this i need my own central heating in my house less and less 
I still want it uh, during the afternoon somewhere at some point with this kind of a temperature. My temperature inside my house at the moment is 16 degrees centigrade Celsius uh, in my living room. And as long as I keep my pullover on and have a fairly hot drink every couple of hours, I will uh, manage with this kind of temperature just fine. I also find that my house gets less stuffy that way and um, less the, I don't know, the heated air feels less pleasant nowadays to me. But I will, in the end, you know, towards the second half of the afternoon or so, I will turn on the heater because I'll, I'll just be fed up with it. What with living a fairly sedentary life, I don't have yucks to look after. <laughs> so I just have to, I just have my house and... Um, depending on where I am with uh, with my process or with other activities or projects or things, I will uh, sit at my table a lot and um, then at some point, of course, you get it gets uncomfortable. So yeah, so then I'll turn on the heater. But so far, I've noticed that if you don't, if you actually have a level of practice, it's like the my body finds it easier to hang on to its own physical heat, its own warmth inside. It's um, it, it, it's active, if you like, if it's colder around me. Just a bit. Not like freezing, because it, this is not Tibet. This is just the Netherlands, where I am. And I don't... Uh, it's not high altitude at all, <laughs> on the contrary. I believe we are at 20 meters above sea level or something like that, something funny. So hot drinkies are uh, really important as well. Um, other than that, getting back to the actual process, it has been so interesting. It has been, it is the reason I am on YouTube and more and more as time passes, I find that this um, approach, this whole set of ideas, it has saved my life. It is saving my life, as it is. As I sit here, as I stand here, it is saving my life, it is saving my sanity. It is al It allows me to confront issues that are, that have been, like, dominating my whole life. Uh, for as long as I can remember, and I, I come out of it wiser and stronger, and so it's incredible, really. So there's a whole set of benefits from the Tumo practice, as I have managed to cobble it together for myself, basically following instinct, and sometimes what made sense to me, you know. Uh, it turns out you have to tame Shakti, okay? And that's it. that is what this is about. That's the simplest way to say it, basically, really, is that you, you, the difficulty for most people, and certainly for everybody in the West, I think, even people who are uh, practitioners of Tantra, who know best of all what it is that I'm talking about, um... They will find, I'm wondering now all of a sudden whether the Dantian stations, so the transforming the processing stations from Chinese medicine, whether they get activated anyway at some point if you do enough Tantra, Tantric work or Tantric meditation. I don't really know. And seeing for myself, because all I have is my own experience about that, really. Seeing how easy it is still for whole parts of me to remain deactivated or less alive or to parts of me, whether physical or vibrational or emotional or mental, you know, mind based things, you know, parts of me, identifications and ideas and stuff that I have, all of that can remain in its old pattern 
as long as I don't bring the parts in question and the Tumo energy together purposefully, on purpose, myself. As long as I don't do that, it will just carry on as usual, as normal, <laughs> regardless, you know? what? Regardless of what's happening to the left and the right of it, to the back of it, everything is... Yes, everything is interconnected, but everything has always also been hugely, hugely fragmented for me. Especially emotionally and mentally, it turns out. So that's why I sort of went and put all my apples in one basket, or all my luck onto this single card, or this single throw of the dice, which is the Tumo. It turns out, two years later, that is what I was doing and what I am still, you know, what I'm still doing. It is still like a gamble, except I I trust it. I know by now that it, it only has really my best interests at heart. It being the Shakti or uh, Tumo energy as, um, as it has been transformed. Because I find that out all the time. I have experiences all the time where you um, you wouldn't really expect the Tumo energy to be this friendly and this level of caring and this gentle with me. Those aren't words that are associated with Shakti or Kundalini energy or Tantra ever. They're always about power. They're always about becoming this powerful person or whatever that's supposed to mean. Um, they're always going on about sex, of course, which is part of the whole thing because that becomes activated and energized also and very easily, you know. And there's a quite often there's a choice in this path whether you want to participate in, in sex or not. If you don't, you use you can use the energy for the continued work inside. And similarly, if it gets too cold here, my Tumo energy gets used up, keeping me warm. And so for, uh, there's a choice, there's choices everywhere, see? So, um, so I wonder now if I should do any more describing of the process. What happens is that, what's happened? Okay, let me just go through my whole two years of practicing Tumo. I think the first whole year I spent mainly uh, working on my first Dantian, which sits in your lower belly area. That is just a level. It's not, um, I don't think it really is anything but a vibrational level. The Dantian. It is quite difficult to uh, connect it to any specific organ or anything of the sort. I may still have to go to the computer and have a, a big look at human anatomy, uh, you know, diagrams and things like that, whether I can actually connect it to any anything specific. I don't think so. It is the Level, there's like a frontier or an air, a frontier area, if you like, that separates the reproductive organs underneath from um, other, you know, digestive organs in the sort of the middle and top half of the belly, like that. And so that, that level, that's the Dantian. There's three of those, according to Chinese medicine, that is. Uh, there's another one in the lower heart area and there's another one in the middle of the brain of the skull like so so as I um, first year was only first on Tian really only by the second half of the year I had sort of made the connection that what I was doing was actually working with the first on Tian and then of course I came to the conclusion very quickly that there should be uh, other processing levels to be had from working with the second and third Dantians. And that's what I've been doing. Except that there have been interwoven in this whole, it's fairly simple, one, two, three, uh, kind of a, kind of
kind of a process as you uh, might, you know, just understand it at that point. Um, there have been other developments on top of that. So there's the one, two, three level, and I'm still very much working with that. Um, very often the, okay, I haven't done any more Tumo teaching on this channel over the past year or so because I was very much not confident that it would be a good idea to do so. However, by now, maybe it will be possible to bring out the information that I have, which is really very simple. It is really very simple to get this process started. And then I'm just hoping that anybody who's actually going for this decides to, from the internet, to believe what I'm saying here and to just go like, okay, bing, light bulb in my brain, this is what I want, kind of a deal, consistently for some time, because you need consistency. You need actual, um, I suppose, devoted practice. I'm saying devoted as in uh, diligent practice, okay? Um, I have not got any, necessarily any religious framework for this, any or any uh, metaphysical framework as it is often given in Buddhism. I believe myself by now that a whole lot of the Buddhist practices that we see, uh, whether in the East or in the West, is actually based on, uh, or at least it has its foundations in Tumo practices, in Tumo experiences at some point in the past, um, which is why some of that can actually be really helpful. There can be, there are points where a sense of religion or a sense of metaphysical self-awareness and connection to other layers of life, invisible forces in life, a sense of purpose and all that kind of thing is actually what we need. So sometimes we need, we need those types of support. However, my whole TUMO deal as it is, as it stands still today at this point, is a vibrational exercise, okay? With repercussions and developments in our emotional lives and in our mental states even, turns out. So that's what I'm investigating. I'm investigating, I'm using myself and my fragmented, chaotic, uh, you know, past and all the rest of it as an experiment to, uh, to work this stuff out. And I, so far, I have had so many benefits and so many moments where all of a sudden everything comes together again that uh, all I want to do is talk about it, you know, and share Mm. Oh, so good. So, the other levels, beside the one, two, three, have been going out through the, activating the crown chakra first, going out through the crown chakra. I will get back to the whole idea of teaching and how you can feel Shakti energy uh, easiest and what the points are for that. There's videos on my channel going a while, a while back already, I think from 2020 mostly, that will that explain this kind of a process, okay? The beginning of the process. So I won't go into that now, but I will come back to it eventually as time goes on and we see where we go from here, okay? But at this point, uh, I just want to point out to you how it becomes, as time goes by, it becomes more and more like levels and complexities embedded into each other and it's in your vibration the whole time so it can be very active in your life on the background while you're just you know working or having a generally having a social life or whatever it doesn't really interfere with that i suppose unless there's conflict and then it depends on who you are, what kind of a temperament you have, 
what's going to happen. So if I've seen one thing, it is that we become more stronger, so more sovereign human beings as we do this. So the um, it depends what you want. And the more you focus on particular areas in your life that you want to improve, really, the TUMO practice will actually help you do that. But it also, it, it requires uh, hardcore honesty and radical self-acceptance in many ways and on several levels again and again and again. It is asked of you, do you suffer or do you accept who you are? So that's good, right? You just have to, at some point you have to uh, choose anyway to, you know, do you accept yourself? Do you, do you accept this is who you are and sold everybody else? Because this is what you're given. So that, yeah, there may be moments there where it goes like, it feels crazy and it feels like you're in pain the whole time. And, um, so I was like that. Okay. For the past, I think the past four months or so I've been on and off have been quite difficult and uh, where I was just now with my description of my energy work as I did it you know is that I uh, came into contact with what I call the Trikaya level of the um, of the Tumo meditation where you go beyond the crown chakra into a different uh, kind of an expression that exists over there. That is number four, the number four kind of activation, what I, what's what is what I would call that. Then going from there, I went back down into the earth to a what I call a fi fifth level activation, okay? And that's where I'm still at now. The fifth level activation where one, two, three is the Dantians in the body, sitting behind and underneath the chakras, if you like, like so. Um, the fourth level up there with potentially what other people would call a soul star chakra is, uh, is one name for that area over there. It's extraordinarily powerful. It's something that you only do like once every couple of months or so, because that's quite enough of that. <laughs> um, then that vibration can be brought through us into the earth. And that's where you discover, where I discovered the subpersonal chakras. And I've been wrestling on and off with a whole lot of past re resolution of the past, of the past of my own in this particular life. In, um, you know, not past lives, just this life <laughs> was enough already where I was in the earth uh, coming to experience different, um, again, different levels where there's a level which has to do sort of in different positions, different levels that have to do with myself as I am, you know, whatever that really means. And there's le levels that are tribal. And the tribal energies were a huge deal for me to um, come to terms with. And there also I have needed um, what I call a white light approach which is the closest thing I have to real religion, actually, where I ask a white light to come and clear out as much as possible of those vibrations that I don't need anymore or that were never really connected to me personally, but that are bothering me, you know? And they can be, those can be like uh, things that give me a headache for often physically, physical headaches, which I can get from... Um, like a charge in my tribal chakra areas, which is like a ways beneath my feet under in the earth, like so. Um, charges of anger and uh, terrible, terrible anger and frustration from people from the past. So I've talked about all this, but I'm just trying to summarize the, what the path was like, if you can still be with me. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, to describe to you what it, where it is that I am now, okay? So, as we do this, I was, so I have this one, two, three set on the one hand. I have the four, five, six, 
four, five, okay? Four plus five. <laughs> Let me not exaggerate here. Six, I don't know, okay? Four and five uh, process on the, on the other hand. And um, actually, I haven't really done all that much with four and five, so with over here and down there, in the past month or so, because it turns out that doing those sort of gives you homework in your energy field for quite a ways to come. So my one, two, three Dantian activations have become that much more powerful and that much more intense and meaningful and powerful in terms of my whole, you know, my life, how I look at my life, how I experience my life. That in particular has been enormously influential. I don't think I'm done yet. So by now I've gotten to a point where I'm actually uh, revisiting each time. The TUMO does itself. You don't have to do anything to it. If you get your activation, all you have to do is sit and let it happen and experience what it feels like and figure out what happens and what you need really at that moment. And sometimes you just have to talk about things or go out for exercise or make drawings, which is something else I will do, you know, or do something like research, which is objectifying and creates mind room, you know, that's nice as well. So on and so forth. So it depends very much. But those are sort of sequels after the actual energy work, after the meditation. The meditation does itself. You do not have to do anything while you're in it except let it happen. Let the, let the change come, whatever needs to be changed. So this is actually the point. I actually talked for half an hour. <laughs> Just reintroducing all my things because I felt that would, would be okay at this point. Fast forward to this week, okay? So I've been uh, wrestling with different interpretations, different levels. I have had a whole lot to do in my whole heart area where the extra activations, so the changes in activation in my tumor field, affected what happens in here, the capabilities I have in here have expanded okay that keeps happening each time there's a new process you get new capabilities then you start using those and i don't like my hair at the moment because i really wish i'd gone to the hairdressers i don't mind the length at all but it just gets kind of pokey <laughs> it goes it's you see what i mean it, it's old hair <laughs> but no hairdresser for me because lockdown so yeah um it will just have to do guys it's clean anyway and i put a bit of oil in so don't complain um every time your capabilities change so that means going full circle which is something i'm really good at apparently going back to things I had resolved in a way up to a point maybe six months ago, you know, or at least I thought I was dealing with them. And now I am asked to deal with them again in a different way. Sound familiar? Maybe it does. So this time around, um, I think that I really needed this whole assemblage point which is another part of a completely different theory about the human energy vibrational organization system if you like um there's videos about the assemblage point in the channel as well you're welcome to check them out if you like uh if you lasted all this time already which is fabulous you know you must be really motivated if you're watching either that or you just like listening to me jabber away and you, none of it really makes any difference. In which case, I will have to write a book, 
Okay, I will probably write a book at some point because it would be a shame not to write a book after all this. Um, capabilities changing, new perspectives, huge, massive widening of perspectives. So it has to all be redigested and regurgitated and blah, you know, endless. It just goes on forever. So in that kind of a context, I was watching the one of my top favorite animation movies, which is Inside Out, uh, for the 25th time or so, I don't know, since it came out. Um, it took a while for me to be able to watch it properly. I ended up buying the DVD even. I was nuts about that movie for so, so, so all sorts of reasons. And um, it turns out that as I see it now, I see something completely different again each time. So that's great because it serves as a sort of a homework um, would you call that an aid <laughs> to my homework where what I used to see in the movie, I can still see that, especially the you know, lovely colors and lovely uh, lighting stuff going on with all that stuff going on. in. I don't know if you've seen it. If you haven't seen it, probably you have seen it. Anyway, I love the movie still. It's still completely awesome. Um, I still love very much that it's, uh, it turns out it's actually, um, the whole setup with the characters and the way things are organized in the mind of the main character, which you're getting to see and the different, you know, the core memories and the personality islands and all that. It turns out that you can actually use that for yourself. Even I, in my situation, finally found out how I can use this approach, this sort of a diagnostic, you know, approach. What would it look like? What would the movie be like? Or at least parts of the movie be like if I was Riley? Okay? If this film, if this movie was about me, what would it look like? <laughs> it was not pretty <laughs> because that came out over the past couple of days and I finally got around to sort of figuring out how uh, the different certainly tribal aspects which I call tribal which have to do with family karma or family um, restrictions in one's personal life you know deep personal um, what do you call those imperatives very often subconscious imperatives. That's all tribal to me. I call that tribal stuff, okay? Where I am not allowed to blah because nobody in my family does that. I'm not allowed to this, that, and the other, you know? All sorts of restrictions in that way. Also, in normal families, like in Riley's family, um, there's permissions, there's possibilities, and there's support and growth and development because of tribe which I do see that <laughs> when it's about somebody else. Um, I can even see it when it's about myself to some extent, where I certainly got the right kinds of, of genes and the right kinds of support for doing this, you know, the blah, blah, really, um, really efficiently, I think, because it's what kept my channel going for all this time. And I can always talk about anything, anywhere, really. So... And there's, you know, plenty um, tribal connections that explain that for me and how that really worked. And it was just a path that uh, that has helped me enormously through time. Also, writing anything with language is uh, is very comfortable for me. So lucky me, right? Um, however, there's other sides. And if I looked at the the so the diagnostic system for in as it sh as it's shown for the main character Riley in the movie if i applied that to myself what i got was this i got a family island so f a family um household okay which is where everybody is born and grows up in to up to a point at least or 
yeah, theoretically your uh, family that you're born to, okay? Um, except because of the huge problems that my parents had, and they had more problems than I can possibly imagine, both of them, you know, what you get is what I visualize as a gravitational lens. So that means that if the, if this is, if this is the, my head is the earth, okay, and this is the sun, what you get is if the sun is in front of me, except that of course it's going to be way too bright, but the, there's going to be like a, a globe that creates an image of my face or of the earth all strewn out like that, strung out as if um, everything is pushed outwards to the edges. A gravitational lens is called that way. It's called that. You can look it up if you want. It's um, everything is deformed. So the, the problems and the trauma that my parents carried around with them, plus the way they interacted with each other, which was a big part of that, has gotten stuck in my brain, because this is three levels, you know, level three tumo still in here. Um, what it looks like from the outside would be this diagnosis of having this huge, massive, like a tumor almost that this family concept that we all need to feel safe in when we're little kids it has just grown into this massive black hole call it a black hole if you like with a gravitational deforming warping effect um, all around it to such an extent that I don't think I really had any other islands myself, certainly no hockey island, and certainly no friendship island, because my mom saw to it that we moved house every year or every two years. And so I never really got to connect with anybody much. And after a while, you give up trying, which may be familiar to some people out there even, you know, because I'm not the only one in this kind of thing. That's why I'm telling you this, trying to explain to you rather than show you pictures, which might be a good idea. I don't know. If I manage to make a proper drawing of this, I could do it. But you get what I mean. The family thing that we needed, the tribal basis, okay, that we needed to be healthy human beings became a black hole. And it warps everything around it. Everything in any kind of proximity to that so all of my mental makeup all of my concept everything got pushed either in flattened into a particular bend orbit around it around the black hole or it got pushed completely out to the outer fringes you know the outermost outmost fringes of my personal universe so I think the only kind of a little personal island that I had, so a personality island, right, like Riley has in the movie, would be some kind of a creativity island, which was accepted and allowed in the family I grew up in with my mum, mostly, after my parents divorced. And I had very little input in that. Nothing ever changed to it. I still basically, I got better at drawing and at painting. But um, I know now, looking back, and it's quite painful to realize that even, that I was wanting the input that my dad would have had, had he been a kind of person to share creativity with me. That wasn't to be. Okay, so all this, I was pretty depressed when I had gotten a hold of what this looked like for me. I had this huge uh, sense of what in the movie is, is uh, for Riley, is her imagination land, which is like a part of her memory bank, where all the old good stuff from her, from being a small kid is stored. And it's really funny the way it's portrayed and it looks really cool and really cute and all. It looks amazing. French fried forest and all that, <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> it's adorable. But for me, I've always felt that that was getting closest to what I felt like myself. So sort of next to this creativity island that I might concede myself ha having, actually, there would be like this massive bloated imagination land where actually everything that should have been a personality island of mine, um, it sort of stayed in the imaginary state. I am finding out as I stand here and explain this to the world. That's what I have. I had figments of the imagination. So I used to live, if you can call it that, up to very recently, um, all I had as a self view of my, a view of myself, an idea of myself, was that everything that mattered to me, everything that I connected with, was imaginary colors and painting and poetry and pretty things and atmosphere and vibe and mood everything had to connect through the other gravitational lens so the other the pink hole if you like of this is going to be an endless long video i just hope you can you're still okay Pause, get a drinky, go into the bath, go shopping, go watch a, go watch another movie. <laughs> Come back later if you feel like it, please. <laughs> um, because I'm not done yet. Okay. So the pink hole of uh, that was my life, and I knew that it wasn't okay. I knew that it wasn't going to be good enough, and I certainly knew in recent years that uh, I didn't like it anymore, but over the recent couple of years, like the recent four years or so, I've noticed the falling away of the value of the imagination. So everything that I used to inhabit, that I kind of lived in, you know, kind of a narcissistic, self-involved, dreamlike, set of states whatever i don't know other people smoke weed the whole time i suppose it isn't that strange after all i noticed that it was falling away and i didn't really have anything else instead i didn't know what to i didn't feel at home here which is not nice because here is where I really am. Okay? We are actually not in fairyland with the, the rainbow unicorns and all that stuff. The Cute as it may be and lovely as it may be. And I mean, I'm all for it. I'm all for having extraordinary dreams. I used to have extraordinarily gorgeous dreams. And it was all about that. But it's not the same. As, you know, getting in here. Okay, so I sort of mapped it out so far with those parts to the whole drama. And I was feeling pretty bad about it all. I was feeling like, uh, how am I ever going to get the fuck out of this? How am I going to... How is this, how how is any of this ever going to change? Because my whole past is like this. I have not been able to cope, obviously. This is a great diagnostic tool. It tells me that I am nuts. I am so warped and so all over. I have no idea how to what to do about any of this. And it makes me sick and miserable. And um I get this whole vibe from my parents again. Uh, again, my parents. Can we just leave my parents alone? <laughs> you know? At some point. Can we finally decide to not have parents again? <laughs> After all those years. And then two more happened. Okay? Again. 
because another level of or not a, not a not a level of activation as much as a sort of a shift in the middle of the night which is when i get most of these moments where i'm actually scrabbling to get some kind of a resolve some kind of a I don't know, I'm fighting against some kind of a demon or something is bothering me hugely, then in the night I actually often have this kind of experience where uh, it goes really fast. I wake up, I have been doing my practice, my basic one, two, three, as far as I want it, or one, two often is just enough and there's enough energy in there and it feels good and comfortable and I'm, you know, relaxed because that's part of the whole two more process, relaxed enough, I sleep, then I wake up at some point, some nameless hour in the middle of the night, and it's like, okay, this was my situation, except now it looks different. It didn't look like the black hole and the pink hole and the little tiny little sense of creativity island that I had, so sort of an excuse for actually having a body or whatever, you know. Um, instead of that, it didn't look like that at all. It was just like the whole diagnosis went out the window, <laughs> Have it, leaving behind a sort of a sense of what it emotionally meant to me. The image went out the window. What I had instead was an endless, huge, like, mile long, I suppose, sort of a mass of tiny sharp crystals tiny shards and fragments of crystals going in all directions connecting to each other by little bits very fragile you know going in all directions down and out and in all around so endless zigzag 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 zig, zig, outwards and uh like a galaxy except not with dots, but with lines. And some of them were connected to each other and they were all actually sort of somewhere very in a very fragile manner connected to the whole thing. And each of those lines, each and every single one of those lines and those fragments and those little sharp surfaces or slivers of whatever you had, you know, yellow against black, bright, shiny yellow. Each of those was a, f a moment of self-fragmentation, if you like. A moment in time, some specific moment in time. So you might have, if you'd had the patience for that, and supposing you didn't, like I did, feel like, okay, this needs to change ASAP, uh, <laughs> because I'm not being the whole, I'm not being this kind of a fragile, that's not a good idea. This is mental health. I'm still talking about mental, this is not in here, this is in here. Okay, <laughs> bear with, we're still, we're still getting there. Um, you might have put, put time and date and time stamps to each and every one of them where the example I gave to my husband, because he knows all about this, thank goodness we talked about everything all the time. The example of my granddad, my mother's dad visiting with us where, when we lived in France, when my mum and I lived in France, he'd come over to visit with us and sometimes stay at a camping ground or in the area, in a camping place with his caravan or uh, he would stay with us even, you know, in the beginning. And um, he wanted to see us, he wanted to see me. He wanted to be on holiday himself anyway, so he came. For me, the moment of fragmentation would be when he left again. Because I liked my granddad, I got along, got along quite well with him. He got along with me, we understood each other in a very easygoing kind of a way. I never expected him to be any different from what he was. And he was okay with who I was, I guess. I don't know if you noticed, but there's a lot more light all of a sudden because the sun's coming out. There's light on my kitchen. <laughs> See? Quite a bit more light. So, 
more color, hopefully. It looks really pale and f faded for some reason, but okay. The moment my granddad would leave, this has happened like a dozen times at least over the course of the years, uh, there was a part of me that would want to go with him and a part of me that wants to stay where I was, right? Just like rip, separation, fragmentation. Very simple, very simple, undramatic, untheatrical kind of a moment where as a kid, that's what you go through. It's that simple. That's how many kinds of fragmentation uh, actually occur and happen to us where it isn't really all that dramatic and you don't even notice like it's this huge painful experience. It doesn't have to be ex like that super painful. It, you don't even have to... I didn't. I don't think I noticed any of this and there were hundreds of that kind of experience in my life for me not every day maybe but often you know and I think it's very very normal but most of us we have those fragmented kinds of situations um, going on okay but we have a better tribal connection a better family connection better things learned, better, more solid personality islands. And if I watch Inside Out now, all I'm going having huge alarm bells about is how Riley's dad is capable because of the expectation that they have of each other that also that she, Riley, has of herself as being this happy person that nearly destroys her. And having had experiences where people come to comfort her and look out for her, it just does get too much in the situation that she is in. Um, and her dad is really not helping. So I get worried about that kind of thing. Um, what happened in the end for me with my whole immense crystalline mass of fragmented pieces of bits me okay is that I went in there consciously with my awareness and with my tumor with my field my and my active um available level of you know completely ready level of tumor Shakti energy that had manifested inside me already and it just went in there and from there it changed it it sort of coalesced everything back together in what I felt it took hours and I slept again you know and I woke up again and it continued that's how it goes the whole the in the moment of the image and then the two more coming in there that was less than 30 seconds and then I went back to sleep and went back to it as I woke up again this morning and the whole thing became like a crucible uh, melting uh, melting gold, you know, like that and I could feel it in every cell of my body going like, hey, there you are okay, good, you know good to see you again, floop back into one two more for integration okay isn't that awesome? I um must say that I was never thinking, I was certainly never thinking that Tumo could be this gentle because that did the trick. It was like, it's not a person, it's not a presence. It's a presence, all right, but it's an energy that to me, it's, she takes you by the hand, if you like, but it's not a person. I don't see it as having a face or a personality or any of those things. It just puts this huge warm arm around you and you can... And I wondered afterwards for a bit... Um, 55. Let, let's do this under an hour, please. <laughs> um, I wondered if every crystal goes back and melts 
into its purest um, shape, in, into like a sense of unity, okay? If Tumo creates this sense of unity and all the levels of fragmentation and the levels of dissociation that there were have gone, if they're all gone, then what is left in the crucible of the past? Is there anything left? And the answer is yes, the, the past is still there, but it's um, because the substance inside the crucible is not the same substance as the one I was born with. Or because it has gone through all these processes, I have now a completely new sense of my own mental health, of my own emotional health, of my resilience, of my capacity for understanding other people. Yes, thank you very much. Finally, <laughs> that took some doing. <laughs> Because that's what happens. Fragmentation means that we don't have the oomph to see each other, to be compassionate. This is too more compassion. This is the compassionate energy of the uh, of the force right there. So that was that was what I had to to share now at this day. You know today. I think I'll go finish my uh, my tea and uh, watch some more other uh, other things. I hope you like my uh, my story, my adventures because um it's the best I can do. I was uh, I have started on the blog, but it will so far it will still be making videos for me because it's very very much the easiest thing, the easiest way to uh, get my story out there. Thank you so much for watching, you guys. You're amazing. And um, onward as we, uh, as we can, as best we can, okay? Thank you and uh, see you next time, okay? Ciao.